Hey, thank you everyone for joining us here today. One thing we know is building companies is hard, really hard. And uh, I'm excited that we've got three founders here who face a lot of adversity in building their companies and eager to hear some uh, of the lessons they've learned and some of the unexpected challenges that they've overcome. So uh, let's just dive in without further ado. Um, this is for all three of you. I'd love to start with just a quick overview of the problem you were trying to solve when you started the company. Uh, Tope, maybe we start with you and Calumly. Yes. Hi, I'm Tope Awatana, CEO and founder of Calumly. Um, what Calumly does is we provide the easiest way for um, our users to schedule, prepare and follow up on their external meetings. Uh, we've been doing this since 2013. And I started the business, I started thinking about the business in 2012. Um, you know, my background before that is I was an enterprise software sales, serial entrepreneur, but none of the businesses had really taken off. So I was uh, definitely scarred by that. Um, and I was actually deliberately taking a sabbatical from starting businesses. And uh, my job at the time was I was a software sales rep selling to Fortune 500 companies, trying to arrange this meeting with, you know, what felt like 20 people across three different companies, something like that. And it must have taken, you know, 40, 50 emails over a week or two. So the details are a little uh, vague now, but really what I came away from that, it was just a, I came away from that with a lot of frustration and I just really wanted to sign up for a product that already, that was already um, on the market that could uh, make it easy to compare availability across multiple organizations. And the more I, the more I looked there, you know, there were some interesting products in the market, but I thought all of them, um, I, I, you know, I thought they were doing a good job, but I just thought there was so much more that could be done. And really, that's how the journey of Calendly began. I, I was hoping I could stop thinking about the problem, but the more I tried to stop thinking about it, just the more obsessed I became. And I wasn't happy until I rated my um, 401k to start what is now Calendly. And it's been a, a fun run uh, over the last eight years. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us here. Vlad, how about you and Webflow? Um, well, similarly, I started Webflow a long time ago, actually 2005 was the first iteration. And the big problem I was trying to solve, still trying to solve, same exact problem, uh, is this disparity with how many people are consuming on the internet and how many people are actually creating things on the internet, whether it's websites or applications. There's like this huge disparity between um, like the billions of people who are online and the people who can actually create software. And that's software engineers and becoming a software engineer is really, really hard. And it's something like less than a half of 1% of the world knows how to code. Uh, and yet uh, the power of the internet is like so vast and so many people are um, getting, you know, are able to put it to use, but you have so many more advantages when, when you know how to write code. And we're trying to remove that barrier to, to let people have that same power of code without actually learning how to code. Um, and, that's the, that's the big problem that we're trying to solve. The way I sometimes think about it is kind of like where the literacy in the printing press was 400 years ago, where, you know, writing was invented, people could read, um, but the power of actual distribution of words was, you know, people who could buy printing, printing presses, like people who were like churches, heads of state, rich people, et cetera. That's kind of where we are right now with software creation, like a small, small minority of people are able to truly build for the web and not just like provide content. Uh, and we're trying to remove that disparity, bring that closer to, you know, everybody that can consume, can create, uh, we're just getting started. And I know Wade, you're kind of in that space too. And, um, you know, solving similar problems. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Matilde, how about you in front? Well, so for me, I think the thing I've always obsessed over, like since, I don't know, 15 years is uh, having people more engaged at work. And so it's true both in the company we create and in the product we build. Um, when I started working, it was in 2012, not at front, on front, but started working. Uh, I, I felt like it was crazy that the main tool I was using was e email and it was you know, not designed for companies and had not evolved in the past 20 years and like was less than ideal. So like initially that's the problem I was uh, trying to solve today. What we do is uh, so a communication hub uh, and we help teams that communicate with customers. So it looks like email and it is like email, but we've added collaboration and insights collab and uh, automation so that your team have a better experience and your customers have a better experience. And I've been doing that for six years and it's been a wild journey but that mm -hmm. i've enjoyed so far although it is very hard yeah let's stick with you matilde so one of the things you've been pretty open about is some of the early struggles you faced building the company you know you've talked a little bit about kind of the torrid pace at which you worked 
I'm curious, were there moments, uh, especially in the beginning where you felt like, hey, maybe front won't work. Maybe I might fail. Maybe I'm not cut out with for this. And I, I'm curious how you overcame it and, and what sort of kept you motivated. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I can share one very small anecdote, which is we went through YC and um, we had a product that was not even publicly launched. And I remember you know, entering the Mountain View office and a partner telling me, oh, you're the CEO of France, such a great idea. And in my head, I was convinced he was talking about another company. So, you know, that was my level of confidence in what we were making. Um, and, and the truth is, I think it's something that, uh, you know, has always been on the back of my mind. Like, you know, are we working on something that um, is amazing or not. And it's because I'm a very paranoid person. What helped me, and then we can talk about the fact that I was working a lot, but uh, these existential like crisis, like the thing that helped me a lot was actually going through YC and then hearing a lot of people at dinners, like the CEO of Stripe, the CEO of Dropbox, the, the CEO of Facebook, all of them telling me that they wake up in the morning questioning whether they should be doing that and it's a good idea or not. And I was like, like, of course, as a CEO, you know everything, like the good and the bad. And so you should stop waking up and thinking about this. Like the truth is, if your numbers are good and our numbers have uh, pretty much always been good, so we've been lucky with that, then stop having these you know, existential questions. And so I think that helped me a lot. Uh, I think the thing that was harder is, um, I worked a ton and, um, and it was unsustainable. And so at a point, I think the main reason why I felt like front could fail was because I would fail as a human being. Like I would stop being able to work just because I would, you know, push the limits of what my body could do, uh, so much that I would not be able to work anymore. And I think that when I realized that, like, that's the moment I, um, I worked less. And today yeah. I work less. Yeah. Now, only two years after you founded Front, you also had a, another challenge you faced, which is your co-founder came down with a cancer diagnosis. Can you talk a yeah. little bit about what was going on in your mind when he shared that with you? And, and what were some of the plans you all put in place to not only care for each other, but also care for the business too at the same time? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that happened in 2017. Um was super hard because I had to deal with uh, running the company and trying to pretend that, you know, things were going well, but also, you know, being here for him and also being here for my family. Um, the thing, uh, like, at the end of the day, the thing we understood after the fact is the best thing we can do for the company is to take care of ourselves. And I think maybe that's what we failed uh, at doing in the first few years of France. So that influenced so much what Front is today as a company and who I am as a human being. Like I would say that after this whole episode of, you know, my co-founder was diagnosed with cancer, but that led to me having so much anxiety and, you know, not enjoying life. And that led to me changing a lot of things like, you know, meditating every day, having a healthier relationship with uh, work, like not having any notification or any work application on my phone and many, many, many other things. And this is at an individual level, but at a, at a company level, we've also put a, a lot of emphasis on making sure that people start by taking care of themselves, because I believe they will do their best work if they're happy and healthy, and it starts in your personal life. And so from, you know, telling them this, to leading by example and, you know, taking PTO, not being, you know, connected or online when I'm not supposed to be online to, you know, having health benefits to innovating on more flexibility at, at work. Like these are all things that have changed uh, thanks to my co-founder being diagnosed with cancer. And I think it took me, like, I wish it didn't happen, obviously, uh, but it took me 18 months after that happened for me to think, well, in retrospect, it was net positive, and um, and it's def like definitely the way I think about it now. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Vlad. You immigrated to the United States at nine, and you didn't know any English. And you mentioned uh, you shared in the past that you worked with your dad on odd jobs. I'm curious, what kind of early lessons did you take from that, and and how's that impacted how you've built Webflow? It's uh, a good question. Uh, I did actually know one word of English. Mm -hmm. I remember knowing it on the plane and the word was cloud, which ended up being kind of interesting. <laughs> I still think about that. Um, 
it was also the first movie that I saw. It was Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves on the plane, which is like, you know, fantastic technology for me. It was like entering the future. Uh, but I think the, um, you know, my dad was definitely in that like survival mode, right? As you move into a new country, try to learn a new language, try to make money however you can. Um, so I definitely learned from him uh, how um, experimental and uh, open-minded you have to be to not just do practical things like make a living, uh, but just to explore the space of ideas and opportunities uh, and not be held back by things you don't know. Um, so a lot of the ideas that he came up with, like one was this import export business for like PVC pipes because plastic didn't exist in the USSR and he sort of like saw that opportunity. Um, so, he, you know, nothing held him back. He's like, I don't know anything about the space, but I'm just going to try to make this happen. So the first thing you do is have to make a catalog and you know i don't know how to use graphic design software but i'll get it and i'll get one of my kids to learn uh, how to do it um and that was my that was my role it was essentially without choice i uh, had to learn how to you know do graphic design and uh you know scan in diagrams and reproduce them in uh, illustrator or it was corel draw at the time um and it was like this uh you know the big learning from that was a i can learn way more than i thought i could um, and B, you actually, to learn some skill, you, the best way is to just do it, like to, to actually have a bigger goal in front of you where the, like that skill is just, you know, a means to an end, a bigger end that, that is, uh, you know, more meaningful to you. Uh, and whether that's like learning a language, you immerse yourself into that because what you really want to do is not learn that language, but you want to like experience that culture or whatever. Um, I, I just learned through that process that, uh, I can learn almost anything um, have a bigger goal um, that is, you know, guiding me in, in learning that skill or whatever. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Vlad, you've also talked about before you started uh, Webflow the first time in 2005, but you had multiple attempts to start it and it didn't take until maybe your fourth attempt, I want to say. Uh, I'm curious, by that fourth attempt, you know, you, you'd gotten married, you'd started a family, you know, what was the conversations like with your partner uh, around keeping going at this, taking another stab at this? And, and how do you all sort of work through that relationship in order to, you know, carve out more time to, to spend on Webflow? Ooh, I think that could be a talk in itself. Uh, <laughs> but if I was to summarize it, it was a combination of um, partly my wife being annoyed that I always kept talking about, you know, starting something at some point. So it was almost like this inevitability you know, before we, as we were dating, I was talking about this, as we got married, I was talking about this, uh, as you know, we started a family or, and I had a day job, we were talking about eventually, uh, doing something around Webflow. Cause I, at that point started to try to start a couple of times. So it was like this inevitability, like, yes, it's going to happen at some point. That was one factor, but the biggest factor I think was just the, the readiness in terms of, uh, so our kids were one and three, just a little under one and a little under three at the time. But the readiness of having some financial buffer with three months of savings, which, you know, uh, growing up really poor for us felt like an eternity, uh, you know, like three months, come on, you can build a product in that. We had this, this plan. I promised her that we're going to do a Kickstarter and raise 300 K and then just be totally funded by customers. Uh, and then, you know, of course, three months turned into like 12 months turned into 18 months until we finally had funding. But um, I think that was the, those two factors of just knowing that it had to happen at some point and seeing my, um, you know, energy around it and just uh, just knowing that it, it was one of the things that I have to do in my life, if not the thing, um, and feeling ready as a, as a family of like just financially, like, hey, we can actually do this for at least three months. Uh, that was like the biggest thing. That was like the contract of, uh, all right. Let's do this. Then that actually turned into a series of much harder conversations when money ran out and we were, you know, going broke and then like heavily into debt and then had, you know, medical issues with our kids. And uh, that's a whole different thing. But but then we had some momentum to keep to keep it going because it was like, OK, now close to being launched or uh, we're almost getting into white. Like that. There's always some thread of hope that helped, um, you know, maintain that momentum. No, oh, no. Tope, you also have talked about, you know, uh, starting multiple businesses before Calendly, um, uh, many of them that maybe didn't quite have the success that Calendly has had. I'm, I'm curious, coming from those experiences, you know, what kind of criticisms, what kind of critique did you have around starting Calendly and, and 
who did those criticisms come from and how did you sort of, you know, convince yourself that, hey, this is the one that's going to going to be different? Yeah, really good question. So <clears throat> I could share a lot of different uh, uh, examples of people, people being skeptical, but I think one of one of my favorite ones is my ex boss. So I started Calendly on the nights and weekends, right? So I was still employed by my ex employer while I started Calendly and Calendly launches and it starts to take off and it's clear that we're solving a problem, at least to me, right? Um, and I go to my boss to, uh, you know, to resign. And, <clears throat> and uh, he was really surprised to find out that I started a, uh, a company that was solving the problem of scheduling. And he looked at me like, he had this look on his face and I, you know, like I forget exactly what he said, but what I got out of that conversation was he felt this, he felt like the job was so bad that I got desperate and tried to go create, <laughs> solve a problem that didn't really exist. So that was, uh, that's uh, one of my favorite examples. But in spite of all, in spite of all of that, I remained, um, you know, very optimistic, and you know, really nothing changed my mind for a couple of reasons. One, I'd had the sting of failure many, many times, and so I think once you get that out of your system, like you know, um, you know, there's no like you know you can fail, and so like you just get you get over that one. Two, through the process of you know starting in starting companies and shutting them down, I learned a lot about all the things that I I didn't do right, and most of it was really just a ton of discovery, like really, really deep and thorough discovery around the space, around the market, around customers, around all those things. And I've done that this time around, right? So I've done my homework. Um, as, a matter, as a matter of fact, when I started, before starting Calendly, I went into it looking for reasons not to do it, as opposed to looking for reasons to do it. And at the end of that um, research process, all the signs point towards, you know, this is, you have to do this. Um, more importantly, I knew the problem scheduling very well. I'd spent a lot of my professional career uh, doing it. Um, and um, I just, I really knew everything that the, 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 uh, the incumbents were doing well and the things they weren't doing so well. So like taking a combination of those things. I also thought that the way that we were thinking about scheduling was, you know, we we're creating something that was way more accessible and easier for much more people uh, to use. Our vision was more complete, at least, you know, it was still very early, but we just had a, uh, I, I thought we had a much more complete vision. Vision. More importantly, customers were reacting very positively, positively to it, right? So for the first, you know, three or four businesses that I started, I was dying to get people to use the product. But this time around, I thought about the product. I thought about um, the business model. How do you attract users? All of those things. And so, countless from the second at launch, I actually had no time to like, you know, to. Uh, to be cynical, right? It just it just took off, and I saw people using the product repeat uh, on a repeated uh, basis, and so uh, just really ran with that. So I guess I would say that most of my learning, most of my conviction came from the fact that I'd um, I'd failed many uh, times before that. Yeah, uh, even still, you sound like you had lots of early um, signal from customers that yeah. Calendly was something that you wanted. Um, but one thing you've shared before is that there was a lot of skeptics around you. You mentioned your ex-boss. There's other skeptics around you. How did you deal with that criticism? How did that change or not change what you did with Calendly? Yeah, I mean, I think from, I mean, I think, um, you know, <laughs> until, until very, very recently, it feels like in the last, you know, we've been doing this for eight years now, and it feels like until six months ago, everyone kind of dismissed this problem and thought of it as a small problem. Um, but to me, like what I, what I get the most satisfaction from and where I get my signal from is from our customers, right? So there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time really looking at all these top-down signals. Certainly, I, I look at those, um, but I, you know, one of the things I think Calendly has been really successful is just our, you know, customer and user centricity and really understanding their, the problem of scheduling and how it connects to the most important things to them much better than I think anybody else does. And that's where we aim to be really, really differentiated is just understanding not just the very specific problem that we solve, but how it relates to, to, the, to, the, to the most important problems our customers solve. And I think when you master that and you stay uh, connected to your customers and you just have your, you know, your fingers on the pulse of what they want, um, I think the rest, the conviction becomes very easy and you basically like you're, you have this information that nobody else has, right? Um, so yeah. that's how I've been able to maintain my conviction and optimism and um, uh, over the last eight years. And I, I, I think we're still getting started. I think there's a lot of things we know that we're working on and solving for our customers that the world at large may not be, may not even be thinking about. 
Yeah. Vlad, I'm curious, the similar question to you, you know, you, you had multiple starts and stops on it. Like, how did you have that conviction that Webflow, um, you know, how did you know that it was different this time? Like, what was the things that you picked up on that told you, hey, we, we're actually onto something now? Oh, I wasn't as cut and dry uh, <laughs> um, as uh, like seeing signal from customers. It, it was really the opposite of that, honestly. Um, I, so my background is I actually studied computer science. I hated it. I went to uh, study 3D animation because I wanted to work for Pixar. And I saw just the power of 3D animation software that artists had access to. And then I went back to computer science because like I couldn't get a job in 3D animation. Uh, so then I was, it just became clear to me that something like that needed to exist. But it was like this broad idea that I didn't have a lot of like market validation for. And then so many people had tried and failed like Dreamweaver, Visual Studio, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so the story in my head was like, yes, it needs to exist. There is a better way, but it's unclear how it's actually going to happen. Um, so first time I tried, didn't actually get any customers. And actually the mini startup I started before that, it was this thing called Chatterfox. Uh, I got a lot of data that even if you build something and people come, they can still leave because, you know, they'll churn and nobody wants to pay. And the story in my head was like, this is way harder than I thought it was. Like you... Um, I wasn't sure I was actually cut out to, to run a business. Uh, and then, you know, I think it failed mostly because I, you know, I had to have a day job. So I just wasn't putting in enough time. The third iteration, I had two other co-founders from into it where we actually, you know, formed a corporation, got some funding, uh, and then had a bunch of trademark issues and like tried to build something, but it didn't quite take off. And then like it petered out, never actually delivered a product. Um, and then the last iteration, it was a lot of skepticism, right? Like speaking to everyone, it was essentially, and this was 2012, by the way, when mobile was taking off. So everyone's like, hey, this is a solved problem. Like Squarespace, Weebly, Wix, et cetera. You're entering a massive space. Actually, my ex-boss, when I was resigning, also said the same thing. It was like, hey, this is, it's almost like the same advice I would give somebody starting a travel app today. Like a travel planning app is sort of like the, um, there's, so much competition and nobody wants to pay for it that you're kind of this a fool's errand. Um, so there was a lot of skepticism. Uh, but at that point, I had like this irrational belief that it just has to happen. And it was based on just this one experience in this one conference talk I saw uh, that gave me all this exuberant confidence. And in the conference talk was called um, Inventing on Principle by this person, Brett Victor. And um, you can still just Google inventing on principle, but like half the talk was about something specific. It was kind of Webflow like, so I was inspired by that. But the most important uh, part of the talk was like, why do you do the work that you do? Why do you like, what is the purpose behind the work that, that you spend so much, uh, you know, of your uh, working life de devoted to? And I just couldn't answer that question for the job that I was doing. Um, and it was like, I just have to do this thing that I just really believe needs to exist. Uh, and then we had some signals around, like we had this huge waiting list where I was uh, like, oh, wow, 30,000 people signed up and they really want to use our product. Of course, when we uh, open it up and they can actually sign up, we're, we're just going to be like flowing in money. Um, and it turned out that like 50 of those people converted like five zero out of 30,000 uh, to actual paying customers, which was like a low, right? Where you're like, okay, maybe this customer sentiment isn't there yet and took us like another couple of years to where we were actually we saw some of the same uh signals that calendly saw of like true adoption um so it was kind of all over the place but i think it was like this irrational um confidence at many times of just like this needs to exist uh it, combined with this inspiration i got from that talk of like actually feeling a sense of purpose behind the work that you do and i had that that's the only thing i had with with webflow it's like i needed to make this real uh and i didn't feel that about anything else so uh matilda back to you you know one of the things that uh i sometimes struggle with is how much did i actually get lucky versus how much do i actually know so i'm curious when you think back on your journey through front you know, how much do you attribute your success to luck and how much do you uh, attribute to your perseverance, your hard work, the like um, level of effort that you've put in over, you know, what, almost 10 years now, eight years? Yeah, eight, um, almost eight. Uh, it's an incredibly hard question to answer, obviously, like how can you quantify the, the luck? Uh, like I personally believe that 
I was so lucky and, you know, a lot of what Vlad said resonates with me. Like sometimes there is a, a very small thing that happens that's so fundamental to the success of your company. And so an example for me was uh, when I arrived in the U.S. and I had never traveled outside Europe. So it's like it was and I had worked one year. So I was, you know, young and inexperienced. And I met with uh, Patrick Collison, the CEO of Stripe, and I told him what I was doing and he, he shared with me, well, I think you're uh, a great person to lead this company. And I think you're onto something really big. And I was like, oh my God, like if he believes that and I think highly of him, then, you know, I, I like that gives me confidence. And, I, and this is, it, you know, it's like, I was very lucky that I got to meet with him. Like it was really not meant to happen. It just happened that he met someone that I had met. And so I think these small things become incredibly important in your journey. And like, I was lucky, but like, I think the most important thing is I was lucky to be born the way I was born where, you know, I was in a family that was loving. And so I got a ton of self-confidence. I was good at school that led me to be able to, you know, so much of it is luck and I'm grateful every day and I try to give back. And then of course, that doesn't mean that uh, not a ton of hard work and discipline went into this, just very hard to quantify. Uh, and I, I think the, so, I prefer talking about, um, on the thing that are in my control, I prefer to talk about discipline than about hard work, because I believe that like I would rank discipline way higher on what contributed to our success than hard work. And, you know, it's discipline around just making sure, you know, which metric you're tracking and having no excuse for this metric not to increase to, you know, how you manage time and making sure that you focus on a small number of things, but you do them well and saying no to a lot of other things to, uh, you know, not being distracted because there are so many distractions. If I'm not raising, I'm not raising, I'm not being investors. And, and I do believe that counterintuitively, like uh, discipline is probably the most important thing you have control over that dictates your success. I love that um, focus. That that discipline is definitely resonates with me. If you get good at that, it seems like you can uh, uh, achieve a lot of things. And then you mix a little luck, and uh, things can be really awesome. Yeah. Uh, Toby, uh, uh, a lot of our folks listening today built are not based in Silicon Valley, and you famously uh, have built Calendly outside Silicon Valley. First, you work with a firm in the Ukraine to get the idea off the ground. Your headquarters are in Atlanta. I'm curious if you just start over, would you take the same approach again? And uh, you know, what might you do differently in terms of uh, how you sort of structured the company? Yeah, so by and large, I would take more or less the same approach, right? So, <clears throat> you know, as uh, Mathilde said, founders and CEOs by by definition are paranoid people. They're hypercritical of everything, and so like it's it's almost impossible to not look back at you know the last eight years and find all these things you would have done differently. And I. I have a list of all those things, but I think in the final analysis, it's worked. That said, um, it's not a coincidence that um, Silicon Valley, that, you know, some of the you know, most successful you know, software companies and tech companies that we know are started in Silicon Valley. There's something incredible special about the, about the, um, the, ta- the people, the talent that exists in, the, the boldness of the ideas there. And so if there's one thing I would change is I wish we would have... Um, I wish we would have captured more of that energy and and know how that really comes from Silicon Valley uh, sooner than we did. So fast forward to today, we've actually gone from being headquartered in in Atlanta, and we're very proud of our roots. But we've gone we've become a remote first company, so we're really looking up to you, Wade. <laughs> uh, we've become a remote first company. And fast forward to now, actually, probably something like 20, 30 percent of our our team is maybe uh, now out of the West Coast and with uh, with a lot of experience working for. Um, SaaS companies in Silicon Valley. So, you um, know, all things considered, I would more or less do what we did, but I think I would have found a way to tap uh, into more of that special uh, sauce that comes from Silicon Valley sooner. I think you can have the best of both worlds, the practicality um, <laughs> that comes from being outside Silicon Valley, but they're also like the, the boldness and the, um, and the know-how that comes from Silicon Valley. Love it. Uh, all right. Last question. This one's for all three of you. Uh, if you were starting your business from scratch all over again, what's one thing that you wish you would have known ahead of time? Uh, Tope, let's start with, with you. Yeah. You know, not to sound like a broken record, but I, I, I mean, everything Mathilde said describes my journey uh, to a T. Um, I think the interesting thing that happens is if you create a business and if you do it well enough, 
it'll become your primary identity. The world will primarily see you as the as the person behind this company and all the people around you because you're spending a lot of time with your customers and your team. It is very easy for that to just become your single, you know, your singular identity. Um, and you know, just like Matilda, for the first few years of Calendly, I worked in very, very unsustainable ways, and I gave up many things that bring me energy outside of Calendly. And so, fast forward to year four, um, I began to crash, and I wish I would have invested more in those other things, like my personal relationship, my chips, my hobbies, uh, little things that just give me the energy and the fuel to to really uh, go down this, uh, you know, to really uh, embark on this lifelong journey, which is really what it is. Uh, so I can't ever overemphasize that enough. And, um, and, you know, in very, very simple ways, it's not, it's never too early to be the best employee you can be, right? In the early days when Calendly was just one or two people and, uh, you know, didn't have all the resources in the world. Like one of the things that still sticks with me is people, people that we would interview and not, and maybe not make an offer to say, hey, I'm not going to work for your company, but I can't tell you what, how great the experience was, was get, of getting to know you and I, I, I root for you. So uh, never too early to begin to really create a, a great culture and just a, a, a great uh, team to be a part of. I love that. It's, uh, it's the common theme here of uh, recognizing that once you have that early success, there's a mad dash at the beginning, but over time you realize you're in more of a marathon than a sprint. And so you have to shift your, your perspective. Vlad, how about you? Um, I think I'll just double down on what Toby said, because for me, it's, I wish I had felt the permission to manage my mental health, uh, and, and, um, talk about it openly, energy levels, sustainability, you know, this personal connection of identity to the company, et cetera, way earlier. And had just known that everybody struggles with this and, and not have this, uh, you know, sense that we're the only company that's failing because everybody else is doing, uh, things way better. And then like other companies look at you and secretly think the same thing, but nobody's talking to each other and giving each other permission to, um, you know, just be human. Um, so to me, it's, um, I wish I had felt that permission earlier and gotten support of like coaching, uh, you know, founder support groups, et cetera, earlier, because it can be a very isolating and lonely existence. If you just like, uh, you know, try to manage it all by yourself. And I actually think of it now a less, not a, like a sprint and not even like a marathon because a marathon, you know, you have to train forever for it. Then you run like a maniac and then you basically pass out and throw up and have to go in an ice bath afterwards. So you're doing more rest than you are like the actual activity. A lot of the time, I think of it more like a brisk walk or a hike that you can go on every day with friends and you're like challenging yourself, get, getting more fit, speaking to discipline. You're like incrementally improving, um, you know, while enjoying the journey, while also pushing yourself. Uh, that's the kind of culture I want to push for and create. Um, that's the kinds of things that lead to fulfillment and impact for myself. Um, and, you know, working in way less sustainable ways does not lead to that. It just, just leads to way more stress and this overly unhealthy attachment to, um, you know, work identity, et cetera. So. I love the brisk walk. I think that's a great update on an old uh, sort of uh, proverb here. So uh, I think I'm going to bake that into my language. Uh, Mathilde, how about you? Well, I would have said the exact same thing as the <laughs> but. So I'm going to say something different, <laughs> uh, which is, I think the thing I've realized building this company is it's like, you need to be extremely self-aware and you need to understand yourself so much because you can't really fake it. Like you're pushed so hard um, and you need to learn so fast and you need to be healthy, mentally healthy while, you know, being in this wild journey. And so I would have, it's funny because this morning I was with my coach and I was asking him, it's a new coach for our exec team. And so I was asking him just, what do you think my areas of improvements are? And it was like, you just need to uh, be confident with who you are, like understand why, you know, you are the way you are. And uh, many times I will, for example, like I'm triggered by something and I don't even understand why I'm triggered. It's a bad thing because if I understand myself perfectly well and I can tell my team, like, this is how... I am, and these are the things I'm working on. These are the things that I'm good at. Then I think it would it would make everything simpler. And uh, so I think you won't invest too much in like whether it's a therapist or a coach or books or you know having deep conversations with your parents, trying to understand like what drives you, what your you know triggers are. Like that's um, that's something that is not something I think I prioritized. And now. 
I feel like is just so important because you can't fake anything. I love it. Thank you for sharing, Mathilde. Uh, thank you to all three of you, Mathilde, Vlad, Tope, for being here today. For those of you listening, uh, I hope you were able to pick up some inspiration from these folks who uh, have been in your shoes before. And as you can see, it's not easy. It's not ever easy. Uh, it doesn't get easier, but if you take care of yourself, uh, hopefully you just get a little bit better each day, uh, one step at a time. Uh, thank you all. Thank Thanks you. Thank you all.